Just two contenders are left in the battle for Labour deputy leader. In the first ballot, John Silkin, as predicted, was eliminated. The results of the first ballot gave Dennis Healy just over 45% of the votes, so he needs just 5% more to win. Tony Benn got nearly 37% and John Silkin 18%. Now the second ballot votes are being counted. As Noel Lewis reports from Brighton, the final outcome may depend on the biggest union, the transport workers, who supported Mr Silkin instead of Mr Benn the first time round. It's now neck and neck between Mr Healy and Mr Benn because of the transport workers' vote. Their vote has either gone to Mr Benn or they've spoiled their paper by voting a second time for Mr Silkin, even though he's been eliminated. At the moment, it's not certain. The TNG has a million and a quarter votes, worth about 8% of the total vote. The delegates heard the first result in silence. Ben Tony, 36.627. Haley Dennis, 45.369. Silkin John, 18.004. Therefore, John, uh, Silkin John is eliminated from the second ballot. Thank you. And to swing Mr Healy's way with the decision of the public employees, Newpee, to give him their block vote. But Mr Ben must have done very well in the constituencies. So there could still be a chance for Mr Ben, the executive's first choice. When they met this afternoon, the transport workers would only announce their first ballot decision. We are voting for John Silkin and we hope John Silkin will win now. That's the decision. And have you what happens if he's eliminated? We haven't yet, I'm telling you, we voted for John Silkin and we'll be fighting for John Silkin to win. That's it. After the conference began, the transport workers' delegates had another secret ballot. Earlier, they'd split equally between Mr Ben and Mr Healy. It's the result of that secret last-minute vote which is now going to decide who is going to be the next deputy leader of the Labour Party. The Prime Minister of the Irish Republic, Dr Garrett Fitzgerald, says he's beginning a crusade to make the Republic a genuine non-sectarian country because he says if he were a Protestant in Northern Ireland, he wouldn't want to live in the Republic. Our Dublin correspondent says Dr Fitzgerald's the first Irish Prime Minister to admit publicly the need for fundamental changes and his remarks on sectarianism are bound to cause a storm. The Queen's first official engagement in Australia, where she's to open the the Commonwealth Conference has been delayed by a bomb scare. The motorcade taking her to church in Melbourne was diverted when a telephone caller told police explosives had been planted in another church opposite. The Queen entered church by a different door and the service went ahead as planned. A device was discovered by the Army bomb squad but they said it wasn't explosive. And afterwards, the Queen had her first encounter with the public on this tour, a walkabout that, for security reasons, was briefer than usual. Here in London, talks to resolve the Sunday Times dispute have been going on all day at ACAS, the conciliation service, while the paper's offices are being picketed by the National Graphical Association, whose machine minders want pay differentials restored. It's likely there'll be no times tomorrow, but the Guardian, printed in the same building, may not be affected. The dispute didn't prevent Mr. Harold Evans, editor of the Times, being starter at the Sunday Times National Fun Run. He'd planned to run himself, but he had other more pressing affairs to attend to. Finally, the dream of many small boys came true today for a six-year-old from Rochester in Kent. As first prize in a raffle, James Seaton was chosen to blow up a block of flats in the middle of a housing estate. Six thousand tons of concrete in ruins, but James wasn't that impressed. What about that loud bang? Did it frighten you? No. Not at all? No. In fact, it's quite a quiet bang. And that's all our news for now. Good night.